welcome to the Pastured Pig Podcast, where we share the successes and challenges of raising pigs on pasture. We talk to producers all over the country, from small homesteads to large commercial pasture operations. Whether you're new to pastured pigs or have been raising hogs for decades, we hope you hear new ideas and new perspectives on pasturing hogs. Here's your host, Troy McClung. Well, everybody, welcome back to the Pastured Pig Podcast. Have another good interview set up tonight. Uh, tonight with me, I have Eric Henschel, and he's in Virginia. So welcome to the podcast, Eric. Good evening. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I think I'm going to grow web feet with all this rain we're getting. But other than that, I think we're <laughs> hanging in there. Better than last year. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. yeah. Yeah. Last year's kind of tough to beat, isn't it? Yeah, we floated away all the time last year. That was interesting year for pigs. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Eric, um, tell us a little bit about your setup there. First, kind of where we're talking about geographically where you are, and maybe just give us a 40,000-foot elevation description of your farm setup. So we are in central Virginia, just west of Charlottesville. Uh, a lot of people know that area. University of Virginia is there. Uh, we have little over four acres um, we've been here on the property for I think eight years now and um, you know started into you know and started into this with chickens you know the gateway livestock and exactly yeah I've always liked pigs and so we you know we did chickens first and got a couple of goats and then we got some pigs and just been giving it a whirl since then all right. Well, let's. Uh, so, eight years ago, you acquired this property. Were you um, were you specifically looking for property to farm, or were you just looking for a place to hang out? What What was your motivation there? Um, we were looking to look get a little closer to um, to family. We were living, um, you know, about forty five minutes away on the other side of the mountain, or west of here, and uh, this was actually my uncle's place. And um, they were looking to move, and uh, so it just kind of worked out. We were looking to be closer to home, wanted a little bit of acreage, um, not too much, but a little bit to have some fun with and have a little space from, from people, and it just kind of worked out. We rented for a couple of years, and then we were able to purchase it. So, All right. Is this, uh, did, this, did this property come with any improvements already, or was it just raw land? Uh, it had a house and a little storage shed on it, and uh, since then we have added a uh, added a thirty by thirty shop, which uh, still needs to have the ends enclosed, and um, and I was able to get a uh, a twelve by twelve storage shed from uh, the estate uh, where I've worked. There was one they wanted to get rid of. I was able to have it moved here, so we put a chickens in there and um and have a little stall and you know, feed storage and kind of a garden shed all together yeah all right yeah <laughs> sounds like you're putting some infrastructure together then yeah a little bit at a time it's it's slow but it's it's coming on we've we've probably only been we've done the chickens i think probably five or six years and uh and pigs for three so yeah so in that area of Virginia, I'm very familiar with that area. There, there's um, there's some land that's flat, and there's some land that's not flat. So what what do you have there in that four acres? Ours is ours is definitely rolling. Mm. Ours uh, it, it starts you know the back corner of the property is high, and it goes all the way down into a creek in the bottom. And it it's weird layout because it kind of horseshoes around. Uh, I have a neighbor, and we kind of horseshoe all the way around them. So the layout's a little bit. A little bit weird we've been raising the pigs on about a hundred by hundred area and it starts out really well you can when they're small when you first because we we pretty much we don't breed or anything with the limited space we've done um gotten uh piglets you know six you know probably about eight weeks mm -hmm. and then we we finish them out from there and so when they're younger and small it's nice because i can rotate them a little bit through there and then Toward the end, it turns into more of a dry lot than I would like for it to. But some of the other areas where I want to put them, I don't have some of the infrastructure up. I grew up on a on a dairy farm as a kid, and I, I've chased enough livestock in my life, so I take it a little bit slower. I want to have a, a good secure, good secure perimeter fence because that's that's no fun chasing livestock in the road if you don't have to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I can understand you on that. 
definitely don't want to uh, to uh, plow ahead without having some of that in place. No, definitely not. So we've kind of taken it slow and trying to work on, you know, updating the pasture a little bit. And, you know, as it, you know, every every year planting a little bit different. And, you know, like last year with the rain, you know, it, it, you couldn't keep anything growing. And then it stayed so wet, you couldn't plant anything and give it time. So last year was, was really hard on that area. Yeah. But uh, we, we brought it back a little bit this year, so. Gotcha. All right. So how many uh, how many pigs are you finishing annually? Um, six. Six. Right yeah. Now. Okay. Yeah. Six is pretty much. I think with the way we have it set up right now, in order to not you know degrade the land, that's about the max for the moment. Mm-hmm. So you're getting your feeders feeders in the spring and you're finishing in the fall. Yeah, we're getting our feeders. Uh, you know, optimally, if I can get them, you know, around late April, early May. And then take them through to November. That works out about perfect. We, um, we are there are some peach orchards right in the area where we live, and um, I've been really lucky that uh, they've been able to uh, give me most of the uh, the stuff they can't sell there at the fruit stand. So they get a, so I get a lot of peaches and then a few apples and some pumpkins and stuff toward the end of the season. So getting them right about then is right before peaches really start to come in, so I can take advantage of the the whole season of uh, the fruit that they have. Oh yeah, that's excellent. Very good. So that helps out a lot. Yeah. So I assume you just you just processed here several weeks ago. Then. Yeah, I just picked them up uh, Friday. So. Yeah. I dropped them off on the twentieth, and um, it's with the uh, the holiday. That made it took it a little bit longer. The long weekend for Thanksgiving. So we picked them up on on Friday. Everything was ready. Hmm. They're a lot easier. To, they're a lot easier to handle on the way back, aren't they? You know, I uh, I've been I did a lunch, bunch of research and just having six of them, I can usually park the trailer in there for on the edge for a couple of weeks, and they usually load themselves. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no yeah. heavy lifting. I get lucky with that. So. Yeah, that's nice having access to a trailer that long. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the breed. So, what breed uh, choice did you go with? Are you you raising mutts, or do you have a specific breed you go after? Uh, the first year we did American Guinea hogs. I had been researching that, and and my grandfather raised hogs when I was when we were when I was really little. He he did. He was a uh, commercial beef farmer, and he raised hogs commercially. And I'd kind of heard some, you know, he uh, the fun stories some of the old pig farmers like to tell you. So I was. I've always liked pigs, but I was a little scared too. So I was reading about that breed being docile and just easy to manage. And so we tried some of them. I don't think they were pure guinea hogs because they finished out a little bit heavier than some do. And uh, we really enjoyed that. And then the next year I was going to get the same. And um, you know, it just didn't work out with the uh, the breeder. And so I got to looking around. I was interested. I listened to some other podcasts and done some research on Herefords. And my grandfather used to raise Hereford cattle, and I've always liked that that red and white. So I looked around and was able to actually find some in the area. And so last year and the year so le- this year and last year we did um, Hereford, and uh, some of them had a little bur- little bit of Berkshire in them, so mm-hmm. a little bit of a Hereford Berkshire cross, and just really enjoyed them. They've just been a, a nice breed. They finish well and pretty quickly, and you know, and I just I like red I like red and white pigs. Yeah. So uh, comparing that to Berkshire, are there pros and cons? Or I'm sorry, comparing comparing that to the guinea hog, are you are you seeing pros and cons? Are there you know, pluses and minuses of both? Um, you know the uh, the guinea hogs, the ones we had gotten, they had been you know raised on the they got the people that had them. They had I think a boar and three sows on like a five acre field, and it was some huts, and they did you know all the farrowing, and everything was on pasture, and they seemed to be you know, maybe a little bit, uh, hardier in, in that regard. Like they would eat just about anything vegetable wise and stuff you gave them. And then, whereas the Herefords, they didn't like cucumbers and they didn't like, like peppers or bell peppers. <laughs> if you got any of those, they wouldn't touch them. <laughs> and those Guinea hogs would eat everything yeah. um, like that. Um, but other than that, you know, I liked, we, you know, the kids, the kids really liked the Guinea hogs better. Just personality wise, they're a little smaller you know, they'd go in there and play with them and whatnot. Uh, but as far as everything else, you know, the Herefords eat more just because you can free free choice feed them, whereas the guinea hogs, 
you know, you didn't want to. But on the other hand, it takes about the same amount of time either way. And the yield difference in the end is so much greater with the Hereford opposed to the guinea hog. Yeah, yeah. If we were just doing it for fun here to have one around and, you know, I'd probably have a, have, have one here and you just let it roam around and eat on stuff for, you know, 10 or 12 months. And that would be one thing. But um, I, I remember when we had those first ones processed, the uh, processor asked one of the uh, – one of the guys, one of the meat cutters asked, you know, what breed they were. And I, and I told him, and he said that they had someone that brought mangalitsas in there, and these looked just like that with that porcelain white fat and just the way they were. Either they looked like small mangalitsas. He was impressed with them. Hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I've been really happy with the Herefords. I'm not sure what I'll do this year if I stay with them or if I can find them again. I've basically been – you know, getting on Craigslist and finding them on Craigslist and in the area, trying to, you know, not have to drive. But so far, usually with an hour, hour and a half, yeah. um, it's not too bad. Yeah, definitely. Processing, processing, you know, like most people, is more of an issue to do USDA processing. I'm yeah. looking, I drive on about two hours to do that, so... Well, let's, let's talk about that, your processing and your sales. So uh, with finishing six hogs, I assume that's not just uh, exclusively for family consumption. You're, you're probably getting... No. Yeah. No, we uh, we sold three this year as whole and half. Mm -hmm. Last year we did last year we did four hogs, and we, did, we sold two and kept two. And um, we ended up selling about half of one and eating all the rest of it ourselves. Mm -hmm. We've got... Uh, I've got three three kids and a niece that live with us and then my mother-in-law and so there's seven of us here so we can we can put a hurting on some pork yeah, <laughs> yeah. so this year we speaking. did yeah th this year we did we kept three ourselves and um and we'll sell you know probably at least probably about at least one of them you know i don't really push it too hard because you know i have a few people that want some uh, and some friends and you know, I have a couple ladies I sell eggs to, and one of those, one of them, they like they buy a little bit, and, and but mostly friends and family. And um, it's it's basically really right now a lot of it is, you know, get the kids to know where their where their food comes from, and um, you know have just learn a lot. Be out here, it's really funny. Uh, like I said, I grew up on a uh, on a dairy farm. And I remember my dad was always working because he was he managed the dairy farm. And if you know anything about dairy, it's it's, you know, 365 all the time. And so I had kind of steered away from agriculture for a long time just because of that. And my wife grew up in the city in Charlottesville and and she's a teacher. And she just kind of, I guess, just kind of noticed that, you know, the in some some respects random knowledge and different things that she says that I have and she just really wanted the kids to you know kind of be able to experience some of that so she's the one that kind of pushed it a little bit and and nudged us you know to getting some chickens and then and then just letting it snowball from there so it's just it's been really fun to to get back into it and realize how much I just really like working with livestock yeah yeah excellent well, let's back up a little bit if we can. So you talked about last year raising two, uh, raising four total, raising two for yourself and selling the other two. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's something that you, 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 we hear questions all the time, and I'm sure you know, anyone that raises pigs does as well. Somebody that's just getting into it, you know, the question: How many should I start with, or how should I do this first process? And and if, if speak to uh, this if you would about how that worked out financially for you to raise four finish two and sell two. Again, you don't have to get into specific numbers there, but how did, how did that shake out as far as uh, return on investment? Uh, it shaked out pretty good. Our major, our, our main goal was, you know, in the end to basically have one covered, basically have one for us completely covered. And with that, we achieved that. Um, and then, you know, the, the second one for us, it wasn't, I try to do it where I will, um, you know sell whole in half and i try to you know get a down payment and have basically have them pre-sold you had one other interview where they did a similar way where they can pay me you know like i know if you want if they want one they pay me about half up front and then half about you know a month or so before they're they're processed and 
by doing that, yet yeah, usually covers that covers the cost of the pigs, and and usually keeps up with uh, with all the feed. And then you know if I'm lucky, you know I haven't I haven't done as good of tracking this year as I did last year. Um, I have all the paperwork. I just need to put it all into a spreadsheet and make sure I'm it's shaking out like it needs to. Um, but, uh, it, it came out all right. Like I said, we weren't pushing too hard. I may not be charging quite enough. You look at the, the feed, you know, the, uh, in the past with the Guinea hogs, we really just did, um, a 16% grower finisher feed, but they didn't require very much. You just give them like a half a five a gallon bucket for four of them, you know, twice a day and then let them forage other than that. And then last year we, with the four, we did free feed. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of storage, so but I was also trying a few things. There was a, a gentleman about an hour, hour and a half north of here, and he had some some non-GMO corn he had raised and was selling on the prop on the farm there. I'm not particular myself for non-GMO or not, but it was uh, it was cheaper to buy a hundred pounds of corn from him than it was to buy the the pig feed or to buy, you know, cracked corn from the feed store. Mm. So I'd go up there and buy a bunch of 5,000 pounds of corn from him and then come back and get some soybean meal and some mineral and mix it. And and I tried that and you realize, you know, I don't know if, you know, after the time and, and the fuel and everything, if I was really saving a whole lot, but it, it was, it was, you know, fun to do and the experience. And then this year I just free fed, um, you know, just a conventional 16% grower ration. And, um, but I also was able to buy a, find a, a big tote online, um, for on the, on Craigslist or the, might've been the Facebook marketplace. Mm-hmm. And, um, cause the, at the feed store, they'll give you a, uh, you know, you pay X amount for a bag of feed. And if you buy 10 bags, you get a little bit of a break. And if you buy 20 bags, you get a little bit more of a break. And, um, you know, I had enough storage for about 20 to 25 bags so I could, you know, kind of use the economies of scale a little bit more this year, um, which which helped having six pigs and, you know, going through more, you know, definitely more feed than I did last year. Sure. Yeah. But um, so your your storage, so you, you said something about getting a bin. So what were you actually storing that in? Uh, you know, I, I, I found a uh, a big plastic. It's almost like a plastic pallet tote kind of thing that was made to hold liquid. Mm-hmm. It was you know, the size of a pallet. Yeah, like an IBC three, tote. Three. Yeah, the, yeah, something like an IBC tote, but it was all hard plastic with a lid. Oh no, kidding! It's uh, the, uh some I found some lady in Richmond. Her husband worked for a uh, power company or something. They used to get things in them, and he and they had had a bunch, and she'd finally sold. She's had sold most of them, and I got this. And so about the size of an IBC tote, but it's got a, the whole top is open with a big lid, and uh, it's completely watertight, and um, you can put, you know, 20 bags of feed in it. I'd like to get to the point where I could buy, like, a three-ton a three ton bin and then buy bulk feed. Yeah. Uh, there's at least one mill in the area that I know of, but they only sell a minimum of three tons. <clears throat> And uh, it would be a, a bit of, I think it's about $100 a ton cheaper to buy it that way. Hmm. Uh, but I don't, I just I haven't got to the point where I have the storage yet. So, yeah, yeah, that's the same dilemma I run into <laughs> is storage and transport. We don't, uh, my closest feed, yeah. feed mill is an hour away. So I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not like I can take a, take yeah, a you know, I mean, they running gear with a bin on it up there. So, no, I mean, this one they would, they'll deliver because, I mean, it's, it's the the one of the bigger co-ops in the area over in over in uh, Waynesboro, Augusta, and um, and so they drive other different places, you know, and so they can. There's like a day of the week where they go to some other larger pig farm. They kind of come right through here. So, you know, if I had the the facility for it and they could get the truck in, then they could they could actually deliver it. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be terrible. But on the other hand, you know, I can't doing six pigs a year. I can't justify buying a, a new three-ton bin for 
however many thousands of dollars it right. is, you know. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. got you got to sell a couple of pigs to make that profitable. Yeah, every now and then you'll see one out there that someone has taken down that you can get it for six or eight hundred bucks maybe, but some of those are like you know they're just they're they're nine they're they're like ten or fifteen ton bins, which is a nice deal, but. You know, I don't, I don't have anywhere need for that much storage, or then you have the infrastructure to put it up and put it in. You know, at some point you just have to work with what you've got, what you can work with, and do the best you can with that. Certainly, yeah, yeah, agreed. <clears throat> well, let's. Uh, you, you talked a little bit, Eric, about your pasture setup, but let's talk about that some more. So you said you got about a hundred by hundred area there. So when you bring yeah. your feeders in, are are you subdividing that for rotation, or are they are they just kind of working that whole area the the entire time? I try to I try to subdivide it for rotation so that I can you know at least you know early on when they're small so I can kind of maximize and, and maintain as much pasture for as long as I as long as I can, um, and I kind of break it up into three into three pieces. And move them around. I have a little area where there's a, I have a little hut area with the feeder and water, you know, where I kind of can keep them enclosed and train them to the electric fence. And then I can just break it up with um, I've, d- I've done some of the hog netting and, so- and some of the uh, just poly wire mm-hmm. to break it up. And it's got a it's got a hard um, perimeter fence on three sides, or on basically all the way around. So I run a hot wire on the inside. I realized last year I just had a I didn't have a hot wire on the inside of the perimeter fence everywhere and toward the end of the season, you know, it looked like they were about to root out here and there. So I I made sure I got that up <clears throat> this year to make sure no one got out. Right, yeah. But so that's it and but and along that and so it just kinda radiates from one corner. Um, and that way I can change them and I got some different pallets or whatnot to move them into the different ones. And so it works, it works really well for the first several months. And as they get bigger then they need a little more room and, and, you know, like I said, toward the end, it's harder with that small of a space. It's harder to keep the pasture as lush as I would like for it to be. And, um, I have some, you know, ideas of, having some other areas where I can, you know, move, do, do more of a, a larger rotation uh, around the property. But, um, some of the, uh, ex, some of the perimeter fence isn't up yet. And just some other infrastructure that I'm slowly putting in. Like, like I know most people would, that have done it for a while would probably just put some poly wire up and put the pigs over there and not worry about it. Um, but like I said, I've, I've chased enough livestock in the past, so <laughs> I I like to be extra prepared. Yeah. I don't like surprises like that. So. Oh, well, you know, it's funny. It just uh, it just depends on the animal and and how how long the pig's been there. But it's like uh, just last week, my my oldest son says, "Dad, pig's out," <laughs> and there was our breeding sows. So I'm just just watching her, and and we have such a steep valley. I'm looking you know, from the house, I have a vantage point down to see in the valley. So all I have to do is go out there and just start the side by side up, you know, all the way up the house. Just start that engine, and that's that's the Pavlovian experience for them. They think it's feeding time, and she turns oh, around, good. turns around, books it all the way back up to the barns. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, I agree with you. There were times that that wasn't the case, and it was chasing them down the road and trying to figure out how in the world I was going to get them back in there. So, yeah, knock on wood, I haven't, I haven't, have yet to have any issues like that. It's it's gone quite smoothly so far. This year is the first time we had one of them. She, one of them got a little lame. She was kind of limping around, and I figured maybe she just twisted her knee or something. And so that was fun. I got the vet over here just to check her, and had to. Luckily, I have a, a gate where I out there where I can close off the smaller area, and we were able to pin her in between the gate and the fence, so he could just check her out. But you know, realizing that I don't really have. Uh, you know, some little bit nicer facilities in case something, you know, comes up, you need to capture one mm. would, would be something to definitely add in the future. You kind of, kind of winging it a little bit, you know, like I realized, you know, especially last year when it was so wet that where I have the, the where I have the, the, the pig paddock, you know, the upper part is nice and dry and it kind of slopes down to where my chicken house is. And I have the water and feeder and their, their housing and all in that area. And that's, you know, kind of the lowest point. 
and um, that doesn't work out really well when it's wet. The pigs don't really seem to mind yeah. <laughs> uh, when it's really wet, but, right. um, you know, it seems like it gets deeper and deeper, and, you know, I'm just, you're throwing lots of hay and stuff in there, and just trying, or old straw, or just to, you know, like, for me, I, I hate to see them, you know, knee deep in mud if I can help it. Right, yeah. Um, you know, in that area. So it's, you know, you know, you know, it's, you know, learning your property is, is, is also a good thing. And you think you've been here long enough, and but it always teaches you things. Oh, sure. And like you say, especially with the last year being such an abnormally wet year. Yes. That uh, yes. things you thought you had in place that were going to work, you know, sometimes they get tested in that situation. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we have the exact opposite. You know, times will, you know, we usually have mild winters, as you do as well. And uh, mm-hmm. then you'll have, have that one year where it's, you know, sub zero for two weeks, and then you you really get to the, you know, test how well your buried water lines do and all those things. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we're just running hoses right now. I have a have one of those hundred gallon rubber made stock tanks with a pig with a nipple on it, and uh, that works really well. And uh, you know, if it if toward the end there, if it looks like it's going to get cold, I can throw you know one of those stock tank heaters in the bottom of it, and that. You know, it can be really, you know, sub-zero for a couple of days, and it'll, you know, they can still get water, and the nipple doesn't freeze, so it works, that works really well, actually. Yeah. What what have you found with that situation um, in the summertime, uh, as far as a wallow goes and shade, how do you accommodate them there? Um, shade, part, part of it, I've got some trees along the edge of it, uh, so, and then one one side of it, it stays fairly shady, and there's a couple of cedar trees over the fence. So that hasn't been a major issue. Um, we've got enough rain off and on that, you know, there's, you, you'll notice people talk about, uh, you know, one thing I thought is that they would really root the place up really bad because that's something you hear. And, mm. you know, they, they find areas that they like to dig up, but they'll dig up two or three spots out there, and it's not that bad. So I haven't had any major issues with the wallow and, and basically with it, with all that water running down to that low spot, it stays pretty wet in that area. So it, the wet and shady area are in the same place. So they stay down there in the heat of the day and stay pretty cool and, and content. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, um, as let's, let's kind of go back to you. You'd mentioned a little bit about your processing. Um, when you go to process, uh, are you going to USDA or are you just finding a local processor? Uh, I am going to USDA. Um, if, if I was, if I wanted to do a, a, originally I was, I do the USDA so that we have the option to sell cuts. Hmm. Um, there are a lot of local processors closer, um, you know, within, you know, probably a half an hour to an hour. There's probably several of them. Yeah. Um, and there's even um, a couple of uh, there's even a, a USDA processor within an hour and a half, I think. Yes, yeah, where I went the first year uh, in Harrisonburg, and they do a really nice job, but they didn't do as many of the value added products, like right. they didn't smoke and cure anything. Yeah, and um, sliced pork belly is not bacon. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, That's, that leads to disappointment, so, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It does very much. And so I remember after we went there the first year, I was looking on uh, so on on Craigslist and saw someone else in in this in our county here that was selling some pigs, and I just called them and asked about where they had stuff processed, and and they gave me a couple of names, and um, both of them were you know about two hours away north of here, and so I actually get probably close to you. I drive all the way to all the way to Front Royal. No, no kidding. I had last couple years, and uh, I tried them because a friend of mine last year bought a whole hog. A friend of mine from college, and he was, he lives, you know, that direction. Yeah. So I was like, well, I'll try them, and that way, on my way home, like he can just meet me and make things easier. And uh, and they do a really nice job, and you know everything, you know, all the cured stuff, the bacon and cured hams and everything have just been excellent. And um so I, I went back again this year. I've been really happy with them. Yeah. 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 That's, that's not that far away from y'all. Um, yeah. I was just in front Royal in October actually. Yeah. I, I was hoping to get up there for that event and just wasn't able to. So. All right. All right. Well, um, so what, uh, if, looking forward, what's, what's the next year, next five year plan look like for you and your farm? 
you know, next five years, <clears throat> definitely here on this piece of property, we want to, I've got a little piece of perimeter fence to finish and that'll get everything. All the perimeter will be fenced in. It's half done. It's just getting time to finish it. And then just, uh, you know, adding some more, some more areas for better rotation. <clears throat> we're, we're at my wife and I, we're always looking a little bit for, you know, maybe a little bigger piece of land. Um, it's, it's tough to do in the area cause it's a, uh, it's an expensive area, uh, where we are and most of the land really goes for a premium. So to be able to, you know, legitimately do more agriculture, like we'd like to expand a little bit, but we both also really like our, our current jobs. But, um, you know, we've, we'd like to, you know, do something with more agritourism or an education. Yeah. My wife being a, being a teacher, she really has seen the value of um, just the agriculture and the education side of it. And she would really like to do something more with having a destination for schools to come and do different things and, you know, tours and, and some hands-on stuff. And so that's, you know, we're, we're looking around and maybe in five years or so, but definitely, Definitely in the next five years, adding some more infrastructure here. I think if I had two or three, like if I had, if I expanded the other areas where I want to, um, to, uh, to, to graze pigs, I think we could probably expand to eight or 10. Hmm. Um, cause then we would have more areas to move them around. I've brought probably another acre or so of grass down on the Creek side that isn't completely fenced. So if you have, if we had more room to move the pigs around more than you could give those other areas time to rest and recover right. in between just to expand the rotation and, <clears throat> and, um, just make it more efficient. Yeah. All right. Well, excellent. Well, that sounds like a, sounds like a good plan to move forward on then. Yeah. And just in trying to, you know, learn more about, you know, how just paying attention to how they, they work with the ground and, and, uh, replant some to improve the pastures with uh, forages that they're going to like and you know we kind of like the polyculture and just the regenerative agriculture side of it and just trying to you know increase the the value of, of the land and and put put nutrients back into the soil and just try to make it better than we found it excellent absolutely that's great that's great well and, and I'm going to wrap up here with a question I ask everybody, and I'll, of course, ask you the same. So um, in, in the three years you've been farming, what is your best experience or favorite part about raising pigs on pasture? My favorite part is when you turn those, first get those piglets, and after you've trained them to the electric fence, you turn them out, and they get in that grass and just watch them just mill around and and graze it's it's my favorite thing i just i just love watching them in there eating grass with little blades of grass hanging out of their mouth while they're chewing on them looking at you it's just that's that's my favorite part is just watch them contently graze especially when they're little yeah <laughs> yeah there's definitely something calming about that and, and they, it is definitely they have, is they have a lot of personality yeah and just and watching watching my kids my children grow up with it and and having some of the experiences I had, you know, when my grandfather was raising, yeah. was raising hogs back in the day. So I hear you. All right. Well, Eric, is there uh, is there any? Do you have any online presence where if if somebody wanted to learn more about your place, they can check you out? <laughs> uh, for the most part, we are on um, Instagram, and that's at Henschelhof. H e n s c h e l h o f. Okay. Um, Hof is uh, is. Uh, short for farm in german yeah my my dad came over from germany in the early 60s and as a exchange student of sorts and ended up in the in the dairy industry and and uh, ended up staying over here for i guess it's since uh, 64 i reckon he's still here and right. managed a dairy farm for 30 years so i did that and i had the opportunity to actually work for on a uh farm uh, organic vegetable farm in germany for 10 months as an exchange student oh cool wow All so right. that was interesting yeah yeah i noticed the uh you have more of a traditional spelling of your first name there yep yep All right. 
Well, all right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me tonight. And um, man, I hope uh, hope everything goes well, and I and I hope you have a have a calm winter, and your pastures recover, and you're ready to go uh, this spring. Sounds good. Me as well. All right, man. Take care, Eric. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Troy. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Pastured Pig Podcast. To learn more about our podcast or to submit topics or recommend guests for future episodes, visit redtoolhouse.com.